Hi everyone, this talk is going to be about black box uselessness, a new method to compose separations in cryptography. I'm Geoffroy Couteau and this is a joint work with Pouya Farshim and Mohamed Mahmoudi. So seen from the distance, the landscape of cryptography might look like this. We have a few islands of important primitives such as key agreement, encryption, signatures, and a bunch of assumptions that are used to build them, such as RSA and DDH. However, in reality, the landscape of cryptography looks much more like this to a cryptographer. We have a tremendous amount of primitives, sometimes tiny variants of each other, and dozen, perhaps hundreds of different cryptographic assumptions which we use to build these primitives. And so this state of affair is quite unfortunate because it's extremely hard to analyze in isolation each of these primitives and assumptions one by one. And the problem is we cannot hope to prove them secure all at once because they currently all rely on unproven assumptions, such as the P versus NP problem. So the goal of cryptographic reduction, which is one of the most important areas of cryptography, is to cope with this unsatisfying state of affairs by providing reductions between cryptographic assumptions and cryptographic primitives, showing that the existence of one implies the existence of the other. So this has many advantages. First, it allows to conceptually simplify the landscape into islands of equivalent primitives. It also provides sometimes unexpected new connections between different problems which have very different structures. And also it allows to derive through these connections new constructions of various primitives under well-studied assumptions. In the past few decades, reduction-based cryptography has enjoyed a tremendous amount of successes. Um, if, only, if I were only to mention one, uh, in the area of private key cryptography, the most fundamental assumption of all is the assumption that there are one-way functions. So what's a one-way function? It is a function that can be evaluated in the forward direction in polynomial time, but that cannot be inverted uh, in polynomial time by any polynomial time adversary. And many other interesting primitives have been shown in the 90s to be actually equivalent to the existence of one-way functions. This includes, but is not limited to zero knowledge proof, a commitment scheme, pseudonym functions, signatures, stream ciphers, and so on. However, in countless other cases, we are not aware of any reduction that would prove the existence of one primitive based on the existence of another primitive. For example, we don't know if we can base the existence of public encryption on the existence of one-way function. This is a bit unsatisfying, especially because such reductions must exist. If we believe that one-way functions exist, and if we believe that public encryption also exists, then there has to be a reduction that bases public encryption on the existence of one-way function. Consider, for example, the following reduction. It simply ignores the one-way function and builds a public encryption from scratch. So a lack of a reduction between two cryptographic primitives can be at best a limitation of our techniques for developing cryptographic reductions. So is it possible to identify what limitation is it? Well, the crucial insight in this area was brought to us by Impagliazzo and Hudish in 1989 what they observed was that most cryptographic reductions are black box. This means that these reductions are oblivious to the specific way the source primitive was implemented and also oblivious to uh, the specific way the adversary against the source primitive is implemented. Slightly more formally, there is a black box reduction from a primitive B to a primitive A if there exists a construction of B, which is, this construction is a pair of algorithm PS, such that given any implementation of the primitive A, any concrete construction of the primitive A, whenever this concrete construction 
of A is efficient, then um, P that internally uses access to this efficient construction A is an efficient implementation of B. And there is a reduction S that transforms an adversary, any adversary that will break the uh, primitive P that implements B. It converts any adversary that breaks this primitive P into another adversary that actually breaks uh, the primitive A. Now, when we have this formal reduction, um, we can start proving that it is not possible to find a black box reduction between two important cryptographic primitives. And this is what Impaglietto and Rudis did in their seminal 1989 paper by proving that there exists no black box reduction from key agreement to one-way functions. So bathing one on the other is exactly asking, can we base all of modern cryptography on the most primitive possible assumption in cryptography, which is the existence of one-way functions. So since then, there has been a tremendous number of black box separations between cryptographic primitives. And those explain the limits of our techniques, but also they guide future constructions because they rule out a very large class of methods. Nowadays, we have dozens of black box separation, perhaps hundreds of them. However, there is a strong caveat to all these black box separations and the caveat is the following. Suppose that I have this primitive P in the center of this picture here, and I, it was black box separated from many other primitives, A, B, C, and so on. So for each of these primitives, I know that there is no black box construction of P from this primitive. However, any such impossibility result only rules out the possibility of constructing P in a black box way from a single primitive, say A, alone, in, taken in isolation. So maybe I can prove that A taken in, in isolation cannot be used in any black box construction of P. And there is no black box construction of P from A in isolation. And maybe the same holds for B. But any such impossibility result says nothing about what happens when I start combining primitives. The problem is that in crypto, we do that a lot. Modern cryptography is all about taking a bunch of primitives and assumptions and saying that if you combine them together, then you can build this new primitive. So black box impossibility results, in a sense, are extremely limited in what they teach us because they only tell us that we have no hope of using a primitive in isolation to build another one. But they say nothing about this, whether this primitive might be extremely useful in a black box construction of P that might possibly involve other primitives. And this creates a very undesirable situation because if we want to rule out the possibility of combining various primitives to provide a black box construction of P, then the only thing we currently know uh, that we can do is to prove black box separations between P and any subsets of the primitives that we want to show cannot jointly imply P. So in this work, the core question that we ask is whether we can achieve a much more meaningful and powerful notion of black box separation that in particular will be composable. So what do I mean by composable? I would like to be able to say that um, if A cannot be used to build P via this new notion and B also cannot be used to build P via this new notion, then combining them together will not help me be building P. So what we want is a way of saying that a primitive cannot possibly be useful in any black box construction of the primitive P. The way we define it is as follow. A primitive A is black box useless for P if given any auxiliary primitive Z, if there exists a black box construction of P from RA together with Z, then there must already exist a construction of P from Z alone. So given this notion of black box uselessness, there is a very easy composability theorem, which says that 
if a primitive A is black box useless for P and B is black box useless for P, then taken together, A and B are also black box useless for P. How to prove it? Well, suppose that um, we have a black box construction of P from A, B, and some auxiliary primitive Z. We can group B and Z together into a single primitive Z prime. And we use the fact that A is black box useless for P to say that A and Z prime black box imply P. This implies that Z prime already implies P alone. So now we have a black box construction of P from B and Z. So only the primitive Z prime. But since B itself is black box useless for P, then a construction of P from B and Z implies the black box construction of P from Z alone. And so the pair of primitive AB is jointly black box useless for building P. OK? So in our paper, um, we put first the study of black box uselessness. Our main contributions are fourfold. First, the definitional framework. We identify many flav flavors of this notion of black box uselessness that we put first. In particular, we use the uh, taxonomy of um, black box separation that was um, given in the RTV04 framework. And we define black box uselessness in this taxonomy. So for all possible variants of the notion of black box separations, we also show how to generalize our notion to uh, other settings like black box uselessness with respect to a subset of all possible primitives or black box useness, uselessness in efficient construction that shows the limitations of uh, the use of a primitive uh, if we do not make sufficiently many calls to the primitive in a black box construction. And we formally prove the uh, composition theorem that, has, that I sketched on, a on the previous slide. Then we ask ourselves what black box separations methods in the literature can be directly generalized to provide a stronger black box uselessness result. And we identify one large such class of methods, which is known as the combining out paradigm. And in this paradigm, we show that um, black box separations, they relativize. So this compiling out method, which kind of allows to remove a primitive from a construction uh, in a black box way, this uh, separation message usually re relativizes in the sense that it can still be done in the presence of an auxiliary oracle. So this implies that it actually provides a stronger result, which is black box uselessness. So this gives us kind of for free a large number of black box uselessness results between important cryptographic primitives. Then we ask um, what is perhaps the most fundamental question about black box uselessness which is whether one-way functions are black box useless for building key agreement. Remember that by impact Liazzo Rodish 1989, we know that there is no black box construction of key agreement from one-way function, but perhaps one-way functions um, are useful in building key agreements. And so we conjecture that it's not the case. We conjecture that if there is any construction of key agreement that makes a black box use of a one-way function and other primitives, then we can remove the one-way function and get a black box construction of key agreement from the auxiliary primitive alone. We do not fully prove this conjecture, but we provide a preliminary result in this direction by showing that one-way functions are black box useless in any construction of key agreement that is unbalanced in the sense that one of the two parties makes only a constant number of queries to the one-way function and the other can make an arbitrary number of queries to the one-way function, and both parties can make an arbitrary number of queries to the auxiliary primitive. So given this restriction, we can prove that one-way functions are black box useless for key agreements. And perhaps the most interesting open problem left by our work is to remove this restriction. And then the last thing we study is whether one-way functions could possibly be black box helpful for other primitives. So this is the opposite of black box uselessness. And we conjecture that uh, one-way functions are actually black box helpful for building collision-resistant hash functions, but I will not have time 
to talk about this uh, in this talk. So the definition and composition theorem we already briefly covered in the previous slide. And um, in the main focus of the rest of the talk will be our core result, which is that one-way functions are black box useless for unbalanced key agreements. And before that, I will just on the next slide give a quick teaser on the list of results that we obtain as a byproduct of showing that the compiling out paradigm can be extended to the black box useless regime. As I said, black box separation via the compiling out paradigm relativize. So a few consequences are um, that one way permutation are black box useless in many kind of efficient construction. And using more recent results, we show that one way functions are black box useless for constructing approximate indistinguishability obfuscation, a very important cryptographic primitive. And uh, this can be expanded to actually show that a large number of very strong cryptographic primitives are all black box useless for constructing approximate indistinguishability obfuscation. So moving out to the main results um, of the paper, are one-way functions black box useless for building key agreement? The Impagliator Rudish black box separation works as follows. We consider a situation where we have a candidate construction of key agreement that makes a black box use of an arbitrary one-way function. So we have two parties, Alice and Bob, and they both have access to this one-way function oracle, and they both can make polynomial number of queries to it. And then Alice and Bob interact, they exchange messages, and at the end of the protocol, they output keys, so a key for Alice and a key for Bob. And the protocol is said to be correct if with sufficiently high probability, those two keys are equal. And there is also an attacker, uh, an eavesdropper, Eve, that observes the transcripts and can also interact with the one-way function oracle, and which tries to find out which key, uh, which joint key was generated by Alice and Bob. So the core observation uh, that underlies the uh, black box separation by Impagliato and Rudish is that since the construction is assumed to be black box, then it must work given any implementation of the one-way function, even an, even an inefficient one. So the core idea is the following. We will implement the one-way function with a pair of oracles, which is a random oracle, so a truly random oracle that has a uniformly random truth table, and a p-space oracle. In Pagliato and Rudish showed that even in the presence of a p-space oracle, a random oracle remains a one-way function. So it is a valid way to instantiate our one-way function, even though it's not an efficient one. And then the crux of the proof is to show that given this particular implementation of the one-way function, there exists an efficient attack that makes only a polynomial number of queries to the, to the random oracle um, against any such key agreement. So how does the attack work? I'm only going to describe a simplified version that was described later um, by Brakowski et al. And that only, apply, that only works when uh, the um, key agreement protocol is perfectly correct. But the essence remains the same. So essentially, what I say can be generalized to the original proof for the general case. It's just a bit more tedious to describe. So the intuition behind uh, that underlies this separation is that now since uh, the one-way function is instantiated using a true random oracle, each time Alice and Bob makes queries that are not intersection queries in the sense that they are not queries that they are both going to make to the uh, random oracle, then these queries essentially do not matter for the result because they are completely random and the other party knows nothing about them. What truly matters is the queries that Alice and Bob will both manage to do to the random oracle. So those queries are called intersection queries. So the goal of the eavesdropper Eve will be to find out these intersection queries. The way Eve does that is um, as follows. She will sample in her head many views of the interaction between Alice and Bob in a, in a way that these views are consistent 
with the transcript of the interaction between Alice and Bob. But she will not uh, sample these views by querying the true random oracle. She will sample these views with respect to a random oracle that she simulates in her head. So when she does that, she obtains a list of the queries that Alice made in this simulation. Each time she obtains these queries, she takes all these queries that she made in her head to a fake random oracle and makes them to the true random oracle, obtaining the answers of Alice. No, sorry, the answers of the random oracle. Then in the next round of attack, she redoes the same. She resample a view of Alice, which is consistent uh, with the current transcript, but also consistent with all the queries that she made previously to the true random oracle. And she keeps, uh, at the end of that, making all queries made by her simulation of Alice to the true random oracle, updating her set of uh, previous queries, and always sampling views in a way that is consistent with all these previous queries. And one can see that each time she does that, either um, she did not miss any intersection queries, in which case uh, she will, um, sorry, uh, either she, there was no intersection queries between Alice and Bob, in which case her simulation of the random oracle in her head correspond to a valid choice of random oracle. There is no contradiction because she's using a random oracle which she never queries where Bob queried it. So um, this simulated random oracle together with the true queries of Bob correspond to a valid possibility of random oracle. So by the perfect correctness of the key agreement, each time this is the case, she will compute the right key. Or one of the queries that she made to a simulated random oracle and that she will later make to the true random oracle is a query that also that Bob already made. But this can only happen um, as many times as the number of queries Bob makes to the random oracle. So if Eve repeats this attack uh, twice the number of queries made by Bob plus one, then we are guaranteed that the number of times where this bad event happens is bounded by the number of queries made by Bob. So in the majority of this situation, Eve will compute the right key. So by just computing the majority of all the keys, which we assume to be bits here, but we can generalize to larger uh, keys, um, Eve is guaranteed to find with very high probabilities the key that Alice and Bob agreed upon, which contradicts the security of the key agreement protocol. OK, so that was for the impact nature of Yiddish uh, black box separation between normal function and agreement. So let's keep that in our mind. And now let's think whether we think that one way function should be black box useless for key agreement or not. So some of you might be familiar with the notion of cryptographic obfuscation, which I already briefly mentioned but when I listed our, uh, some results. So uh, those of you who are familiar with it might recall that obfuscation alone does not imply key agreement um, in a black box way. But obfuscation plus one-way functions together can be used to build a key agreement. So at first sight, it might seem that one-way functions cannot be black box useless for building key agreement. However, this construction of key agreement from obfuscation plus one-way function is not black box. And something which is interesting is that actually the previous proof that I gave you by impact data on Rudish already implies that this is inherent in the sense that um, there is no black box construction of one-way function of a um, key agreement from one-way functions plus obfuscation. Why is it the case? Simply because, well, a p-space oracle implies an obfuscation oracle. How? Well, obfuscation means that you can scramble a circuit in a way that um, you cannot distinguish uh, which circuit was scrambled between any pair of equivalent circuits. So the way of scrambling the circuit, uh, given the p-space oracle, is just to use it to find the lexicographically first circuit, which is equivalent, in the sense of having the same input-output behavior, to, to the circuit that we want to obfuscate. So this clearly gives a perfect obfuscation, which is perfectly secure. So that means that the attack by impact data on Rudish actually already proves that one-way functions together with obfuscation does not black box imply key agreement because 
there exists an implementation of the one-way function with a random oracle and of the obfuscation with a p-space oracle such that there is an attack against the resulting protocol, an efficient attack. Now, I forgot to mention previously, but the p-space oracle in the previous proof was used by Eve to make this sampling of use of Alice efficient. So it's an efficient attack. So in fact, um, we claim and we believe that this is inherent in the sense that one-way functions are black box useless for building key agreement. The dream result, which we would really like to prove, would be the following. For any primitive Z, if there exists a black box construction of key agreement from a one-way function and uh, this other primitive Z, then there must already exist a black box construction of key agreement from the primitive Z alone. We prove something very close to these results, but there are two main caveats. The first one uh, in blue here is an artifact of our proof techniques. Our result only applies to the notion of infinitely often one-way functions. So an infinitely often one-way function is uh, a one-way function which is guaranteed to be secure only for uh, an infinite set of security parameters. So we show a black box uselessness of infinitely often one-way functions for key agreement. And uh, our proof works for key standard agreement or infinitely often key agreement. The second limitation is a much more um, limiting one. So represented in red here, we only manage to prove that this separation holds when we limit ourselves to key agreement protocols in which one of the parties makes only a constant number of queries to the one-way function. First, um, we start back from this impagliazzo Rudish attack. So Alice and Bob, they have access to one-way function um, and an auxiliary oracle, Z. And we implement this one-way function with the random oracle and the p-space oracle, as we previously explained. And we start the attack of impact of Rodish. So Eve starts creating many views of Alice in her head, which are consistent with the transcript of the interaction between Alice and Bob with respect to a simulated random oracle. But now to do that, she has to sample this view uh, consistent with the transcript, the simulated random oracle, but the true oracle Z. The problem is that this sampling can involve doing exponentially many rejection sampling um, of views uh, and checking whether they are consistent with the transcript. But this in general will require exponentially many calls to Z. So the previous proof of Impagliazzo and Rudish breaks down as soon as we add another Oracle Z. And in fact, this is uh, unavoidable because um, we could not hope to prove that we can break any construction of a key agreement given any auxiliary primitive Z. Z could be itself a key agreement primitive for all we know. So to get around this issue, the core observation of our work is that when Eve is trying to sample a view consistent with a transcript and the calls of Bob uh, to the true oracle Z, this can be formulated as sampling a pre-image of some efficient function which, uh, which is given oracle access to Z. So this, what is this function? It's a function that is given Oracle access to Z and sim, uh, simulates a random Oracle. So it's just, this is just a huge random tape. Then it runs Alice and Bob internally doing the calls to the true um, pr primitive Oracle Z and outputting the transcript. And now given this transcript, we want to inverse sample views for Alice and Bob, which are consistent with it. So this is very close to the task of inverting a, um, a function, an efficient function. So the core idea is to make a case distinction based on whether there exists or not one-way functions relative to Z. The idea is the following. Suppose that there exists no one-way functions relative to Z, in which case we prove that it is possible to efficiently sample a pre-image 
uh, to any efficient function given Oracle access to Z. The, the other case is that there might exist a one-way function relative to Z. But if this is the case, then we do not need the one-way function in the construction in the first place, because we can simply build a key agreement from Z alone by using Z to build the one-way function, and then using Z together with the one-way function built from Z to instantiate the one-way function in this construction of key agreement that we assume existed. And then we get an efficient construction of key agreement from Z alone. So this is really the, the core uh, of the proof. Now, I told you that we don't actually manage to prove the full results. And that's because in this proof techniques, there are two caveats. The first caveat is that in this proof techniques, we crucially need that Bob makes only a constant number of queries. So take any function that makes n queries to the auxiliary primitive z, and assume that there is no one-way function uh, relative to z, so we can uh, invert it, say, in a quadratic amount of queries. So we really break, in a very strong sense, all possible one-way functions. So how does Eve implement the impact Zoredish attack, given this one-way function inverter? Well, we first consider the one-way function that samples the transcripts of the interaction between Alice and Bob. It makes some number n of queries to z. And Alice uh, does the first round of the attack in time n squared by inverting this function. But then at the next round, the one-way function that Alice needs to invert now is not only the one that samples the transcript, because Alice, uh, sorry, Eve now needs to uh, do this pre-image sampling consistent with a set of queries that she made previously. So the only way to do that is to consider the function that samples the transcript in the first round, then computes um, the, the, the queries to the random oracle, and then samples the transcript consistent with this, uh, with this function, with this uh, queries to the random oracle. But that means that the function that Eve must invert after the second round itself already involves in the forward direction, the inversion in the first round. So this is a function that takes time, say, about n squared. So inverting it takes time n to the four. And if the attack continue at the third round, then the forward direction of the one-way function that Eve must invert takes time n to the four. So inverting it can take time n to the eight. And so by continuing this way, we see that after repeating the attack a number of times, which is proportional to the number of queries of Bob, because that's the number of rounds of attack in the impagliato Hodish attack, then the complexity of the attack here will be um, will grow exponentially, like actually even doubly exponentially, with the number of queries made by Bob. So to make this efficient, we need to restrict the number of queries made by Bob to be a constant. And of course, since we can always exchange the roles of Alice and Bob, all we need is that at least one of the parties makes only a constant number of queries to the one-way function and an arbitrary number of queries to the auxiliary primitive. And this is really the core limitation of our result. The second caveat that I mentioned is a restriction to infinitely often one-way functions. The reason for this caveat is as follow. Recall that Eve must invert a number of one-way functions in this attack that is proportional to the number of queries made by Bob relative to Z. The problem is that if we only assume the inexistence of one-way function, um, this assumption only gives us an infinitely often one uh, inverter, saying that there is no one-way function which is secure for all large enough security parameters, means that there exists an inefficient inverter for an infinite number of security parameters. But now we have many one-way functions to invert, and we have no guarantee that we'll be able to find an efficient inverter that for a given security parameter will be able to simultaneously invert all these one-way functions. For each of these one-way functions in isolation, our inverter inverts them 
on an, an infinite amount of security parameters, but there might not be any single security parameters where it inverts them all. So to get around this point, uh, we make the case distinction based on the existence or inexistence of infinitely often one-way functions relative to Z. Since the inexistence of an infinitely often one-way functions relative to Z now gives us an inverter that succeeds at inverting all possible one-way functions simultaneously for all large enough security parameters. And this limitation is less strong in this because there is no known example of black box reduction that does not already translate to the infinity of an regime. So this still gives a pretty meaningful result. So there are several interesting open questions uh, left in our work. The core one maybe is whether we can extend our result to all key agreement protocols and not only those where uh, one of the parties makes only a constant number of queries to the one-way function. We conjecture that it can be done. Uh, another interesting question is to expand the number of separations techniques that we know how to expand to the black box uselessness result. So uh, to, to get um, a larger amount of meaningful black box uselessness results um, in cryptography. And it, was, it will also be very interesting to prove that one-way functions are actually black box helpful for collision resistant hash functions. We also conjecture this to be the case. And we discuss it in the paper, but we could not prove the conjecture. We could only relate it to other interesting conjectures uh, uh, related to random oracles. So that's all for my talk. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. I'm, I'll be happy to see you at the live talk.